On Tuesday the 30th of January 1649, King Charles I left St James's Palace. He had lived there as a teenage heir to the throne, but now he was a prisoner king. The 48-year-old had woken at 4am. The morning was bitterly cold. Today would be the last day of his life. The more radical elements of the English Parliament, who had contributed to defeating the King in the civil wars, had now decided that he should die. The fatal moment would not occur in a corner, but after a public show trial, he was to be executed outside his own palace in central London. To prepare for what he called his second marriage day, Thomas Herbert, a parliamentarian spy who had been appointed to wait on the king, brushes his hair and dresses him. The king wears his trademark single pearl earring, which is topped by a small golden crown. Today, this is on display in the Harley Gallery at Welbeck Abbey. King Charles wears two shirts to stop him shivering from the cold in case some mistake it as fear. As he says, I fear not death. He wears a black satin doublet crossed by the ribbon of the Order of the Garter and a cloak displaying a silver star of the same order. He had said goodbye to his two younger children the previous day, an ordeal that had seen him collapse afterwards. Prayers with the Bishop of London, William Juxon. Matthew 27, the Passion of the Christ, moves the king, referring as it does to Jesus being shut up in the hands of his enemies. Afterwards, the king, Juxon and Herbert leave St. James's and walk across the park towards Whitehall Palace. It's 10 a.m. A file of soldiers stand ready to guard the king and escort him to his death. The drumbeat purposefully drowns out any chance of protests. At the rabbit warren that is Whitehall Palace, the royal party climb the staircase and enter. They proceed through the gallery and the Holbein Gate, below which is the main thoroughfare that runs to Westminster. Windows offer a glimpse of the scaffold, which is hung with black. Entering the privy gallery, studded with over 100 paintings, the faces of the king's European counterparts look back at him. The Duke of Savoy, King of Hungary and Emperor Charles V. From here, he is escorted into his private lodgings, along with Juxon and Herbert. A four-hour wait ensues. Hour after anxious hour passed. Juxon suggested a little food and drink. The king refused. Having already taken the sacrament, he would not have anything pass his lips. Juxon protests, warning that the cold weather and such a long fast might trigger a faint. At last, Charles gave way and partook of a little bread and claret. Why the delay? Outside, unbeknown to the King, emergency legislation was being rushed through Parliament to outlaw the proclamation of a new monarch. Two Dutch envoys, sent to intervene for the King's life, were also stonewalled by the House of Commons. These anxious hours came to an end at 2pm, when officers knocked on the door. Juxon and Herbert fell to their knees with tears in their eyes, but Charles helped the old bishop to his feet. Soldiers lined the walls of the gallery as the king passed. The famed ceiling of the banqueting house had been painted by Rubens to capture the majesty of the Stuart dynasty and its divine right to rule. Charles now walked beneath it and to his feet, ready to spill his blood in preservation of all this iconic allegory encapsulated. Upon stepping onto the black draped scaffold, Charles saw numerous spectators in the windows and rooftops thereabouts. One noted that the king walked with the same unconcernedness of motion 
as if attending a mask. Two army colonels were present along with a few soldiers and note takers. The executioner and his assistant were disguised with ghoulish masks and false beards, dressed in similar apparel to that of sailors. The block in the centre was just six inches high and 18 inches long. It condemned Charles to an ignominious end. Scattered sand would soak up his blood while a cheap wooden coffin was ready for his corpse. Staples had been driven into the boards with iron chains and ropes that could hold him in place if he should struggle. Though Charles came freely to give himself up to God, he balked at the height of the block and made a request to raise it, but it was refused. Shops had been instructed to remain open as usual, with the public held back out of earshot by lines of soldiers and horsemen. The king took from his pocket a piece of paper four inches square and addressed himself to Colonel Matthew Tomlinson and others. This was his chance to get a final message across, one that he could not deliver during his trial. Every minute of this crisp Tuesday afternoon was crucial, more lasting and powerful than any Nearsby or Marston Moor. As he prepared to exit his stage, Charles played his last role, that of martyr. I could hold my peace very well, he admitted, but silence would only lead some to speculate I did submit to the guilt. Declaring I never did begin this war with the two houses of Parliament, he did not blame Parliament as a whole, but only a few ill instruments. He suggested that the dates of commissions be compared as evidence. They began upon me. As ever, the Earl of Strafford was never far from his thoughts. The King's role in permitting Strafford's execution, after immense pressure had been brought to bear by Parliament, was, he felt, one of the main reasons why God had punished him. Charles referred to Strafford's execution as an unjust sentence that I suffered to take effect. Soon, the guilt that had tormented Charles for eight years would be washed away. Turning to Bishop Juxon, who might bear him witness, Charles explained that he had forgiven all the world, and even those who were the chief causes of my death. The peace of the kingdom was worthy of his last gasp, and he prayed with all his soul that the right course might be taken in future, warning that conquest is never a just end. Believe it, you will never do right, nor God will never prosper you until you give him his due, the king his due, that is my successors, and the people their due. I am as much for them as any of you. On the question of his people, Charles asserted that their liberty and freedom went hand in hand with the law. If he had submitted to an arbitrary way, where laws were changed according to the power of the sword, then he need not have fallen to this point. Though subject and sovereign were clean, different things, Charles declared that he was putting his head on the block in defence of the laws of the land, which made him a martyr of the people. Juxon interceded. Perhaps for the world's satisfaction, something might be said about personal beliefs. Charles thanked him. He'd almost forgotten. I declare before you all that I die a Christian, according to the profession of the Church of England, as I found it left by my father. Turning to the executioner, Charles explained that he would say some short prayers and, when ready, would thrust out his hands. Next, he put on a white satin nightcap and, with Juxon's help, tucked his hair underneath. Juxon told him, The stage is turbulent and troublesome. It will carry you from earth to heaven, and there you shall find, to your great joy, the prize. You haste to a crown of glory. Charles replied, I go from a corruptible 
to an incorruptible crown where no disturbance can be. Juxon responded, you are exchanged from a temporal to an eternal crown, a good exchange. Removing his cloak and then his garter medal, Charles handed it to Juxon with the word, remember. Then he laid his neck on the block. When his hair was adjusted by the executioner, he entreated the man to stay for the sign and then continued in whispered prayer. I will, sir, and it please your majesty. Upon stretching forth his arms, the axe struck a clean blow through the fourth cervical vertebrae. The assistant, after holding the decapitated head aloft by the hair, threw it to the floor, leaving the face bruised. The military cleared the streets. <laughs>